Je vais pas te les piquer. Non, non, non. Je te promets, je les pique pas. Je te promets, je les pique pas. Ludovic. Je veux les lire, c'est tout. Okay, so uh, now let's talk about uh, Google Summer of Code and Mozilla. Welcome in the room. Um, so it's going to be presented by um, Gervers and Florian. So Gervers is the Mozilla's expert in legalities, a real, real expert. You can believe in me. He works on public policy, governance, community peacekeeping, Bugzilla, security, and CS stuff, but also licensing and trademarks, and in fact, anything else is ends fine to do. Florian he is um, working on WebRTC apps. As a Mozilla employee, he is an administrator for Mozilla's participation in Google Summer of Code. And he is also the founder and the lead developer of Instant Bird. So, Mozilla has participated in the Google Summer of Code every year since it started. This talk will review what Mozilla has gained, show off a few successful projects, and explain the great opportunities to participate for both students and mentors. So please welcome Javas and Florian. Thank you. Okay, so thanks for the introduction, Claire. We are here to talk about Mozilla's participation in Summer of Code. So first, let's explain what Summer of Code is. So a quote from the Google website, Summer of Code is a global program that offers post-secondary student developers, ages 18 or older, stipends to write that's code. That's money. Yes, that's money. A lot of money for, uh, for students. To write code for various open source proje uh, software projects. So, this is like a description from a, lo a legal text, so let's see a more complete Flip description. Flip bits, not burgers. Exactly. Next slide. So... You can you, you run your own slides. So, more specifically for developers, this means that you will be, uh, as students, you will be connected with mentors to write code for eight weeks during the summer. So this is eight weeks with everything you need to write code. Okay, so this is Summer of Code. We introduced the topic. Now let's introduce ourselves, but Claire has already done it, so let's introduce ourselves as how we relate to the Summer of Code program. So I'm Florian. I was a Summer of Code student in 2006 for a Mozilla organization. I applied again in 2007, but my project wasn't selected. And in this Sorry. Case, I would encourage you to just do the project again if you like it. The project was in standard. And as Claire said, it's still alive and I'm leading the small developer community we have for this. For those who don't know, Instant Bird is a Mozilla platform-based instant messaging application. Thanks. I was mentor during the last three years. I helped Jerv administrate last year and I will be administrator this year. And now, Jerv. Hi. I'm Jerv. I've been doing Mozilla stuff since early 2000 and my mic is ringing. I think, I think it's mine. Yes, the Yes. Yes. I have a loud voice. I've been doing Mozilla stuff since 2000, uh, and I've been Mozilla's Google Summer of Code administrator since the program started in 2005, although last year and this year I've been handing over to Florian. I mentored three projects in 2005, 2007, and 2009. I did two in 2005. Neither was particularly successful. We've learned a great deal uh, about what makes a successful project uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and yes, as Florian said, uh, I am in the process of handing over. Now, some numbers for you. Uh, in 2013, uh, 117 different free software organizations participated in Summer of Code, which involved nearly 1,200 students from around the world who were in about 70 countries. Uh, so the program has been getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and if you multiply 1,192 by 5,000, you will get an approximate size of uh, the, the main component of the budget for the program. So it's very generous of Google. Since 2005, there have been 7,500 
successful students, or maybe that's successful projects, because sometimes students come back and do multiple projects. There have been over 7,000 mentors uh, from 100 countries, and Summer of Code students have written over 50 million lines of code of, I am sure it is true, variable quality. Um, from Mozilla's perspective, we have had 117 students, um, uh, of whom 99 passed, which is a pass rate of 85%. Uh, that is actually pretty much on the average, uh, at least for the 2013 average pass rate across organisations was 86%. So um, we've, we've had, uh, you know, it, it goes up and it goes down, but, you know, we seem to have about the same number of students passing and failing as everyone else. In 2013, we had 21 students, uh, up from, I think, about maybe 10 or fewer in 2005. Uh, you can see a graph here. Um, we had about the same number of students each year for the first sort of seven or eight years. And then the last two years, uh, either Google's been expanding the program or they've decided they like us more. Uh, or we've had more good uh, projects. I'm not quite sure what combination it is. Uh, but uh, the number has, has risen significantly, which of course requires more administration work, which is where Florian comes in. Um, 2009 was an interesting year. We had quite a few students fail that year. Um, one, one student um, uh, disappeared off the radar after a week and reappeared a month later saying, uh, yeah, sorry, I had a major car crash. <laughs> so um, that, that was pretty much the end of his participation. Although two years later, another student said the same thing. And I started to think, hmm, yes. They're like, yeah, just give me the money and I'll catch up in the second half. It's like, well, you know, it's very hard to tell if someone has actually been in a car crash short of going to visit them and looking at their bump and scratch marks. But anyway, um, that's, that's roughly the shape of how it's been. Okay, so let's now talk about who can participate. First, talk about, let's talk about the students. So again, I'm quoting the Google website. To qualify, to qualify as a student, you need to be an individual enrolled or in or accepted into an accredited in institution, including, but not necessarily limited to, colleges, universities, master programs, PhD programs, and <coughs> undergraduate pro graduate programs. You must also be eligible to, eligible to work in the country in which you will reside throughout the duration of a program. So this means, uh, if I summarize, you need to be a student and be able to prove it, and you need to be able to receive money. Now, um, under those criteria, Hands up in this room if you would be eligible to participate in Summer of Code as a student in the year 2014. Yep. Excellent. There's at least 25 applications, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> no, so, you know, all of the people who put their hand up, please do seriously uh, consider applying. Okay, next, let, let's look at who can be a mentor. So the mentors for Mozilla need to have been Mozillians for a while. Like, while many of projects are interesting, if we have no link with Mozilla, we would suggest applying for another organization for a project. So be a Mozillian. That should be okay in this room, I guess. Have a good understanding of the code area or the type of code that's related to the project. Of course, you need to know what you're doing about this if you want to help the student. And you need to be willing to commit to looking after a student for the duration of the summer. So the definition of code uh, is slightly flexible. We've had people doing um, example code for the Mozilla Developer Network. Pure documentation projects aren't allowed, nor are pure QA projects. But there, you know, there's a, it doesn't have to be um, you know, sort of deep C++ hacking. There are, you know, there are, there's some flexibility there. Now, um, hands up who in this room thinks that there is an area of code within Mozilla for which they would perhaps qualify as a Summer of Code mentor. Yeah, you see, after I said what I said about the first lot, they're all like, no, nah, I'm not going to admit to it. OK, fewer people. That is interesting, actually. Uh, I'm, yeah, well, there we go. OK, so let's now talk about what you get by participating. So as a student, of course, there's some money. That's interesting, but I'm hoping it's not the only reason to consider Summer of Code. <laughs> So what you get, apart from the money, is a mentor dedicated to helping you. And here is how the mentor will help you. First, they will help you define the project to be sure that it fits the criteria for Summer of Code, is the right size, is something interesting that people will want to help you with. They will also help you get up to speed as soon as possible, which means, for example, that they will help you understand the, 
policies to submit patches, to get reviews, and also find the right tools that are work well for you. So get an efficient workflow. They will get you in touch with the right people. So for example, within Mozilla, for some projects, you will not only be touching code, but you will also be discussing user interactions, user interface. So we have a user experience team with people that you will want to talk to. In some cases, there may be security implications. You will want to talk to security people. And the mentor will introduce you to these people because you can't just guess who they are. So don't because worry about it. Because it's security, so they're secret. That's not true. No, I'm joking. And of course, during the whole duration of the summer, the mentor will provide advice and feedback. So you will never get stuck. Fully. So basically, if you were thinking of getting involved with or getting more or seriously involved with a free software project, but find that prospect a little bit daunting or difficult or don't have time, Summer of Code is a great way because not only do you get paid for getting involved, but you get someone whose job it is to help you get involved. So um, it's a really great on-ramp, if you like, for proper free software involvement, which can lead on to many other great things, including fun and profit. Now let's see what it looks like for mentors. So the obvious thing is you get a student focusing on a project you care about for the duration of the summer. But you should also think about investing in your community and this is a great way to train new community members and it's really common that Summer of Code students become long-term contributors even if they are no longer paid after the end of the summer. They just enjoy working with you if you do a great job as a mentor and they will stay around for years and maybe even consider being a mentor uh, the next years. I, I'm not sure really common is... We, we get people who do that every year but people's involvement post Summer of Code does vary. It's not uncommon ever. It's, uh, it's not uncommon. Yes. And also, uh, uh, it's a personal growth opportunity because you have the opportunity to mentor someone and develop your mentoring skills, but <laughs> not just at one point in time, but doing it through the duration of the summer. So it gives you time to improve if everything is not perfect immediately. Particularly in an organization with already so many volunteers and ambitions to have so many more volunteers that Mozilla does. If you're a Mozilla community member, developing mentoring skills uh, and the ability to uh, help people along in a volunteer role is a really, really useful skill to have. And Summer of Code is a great way to do it. So we're now going to give some examples of successful Summer of Code projects we have had in the past. So I've selected two projects I will just talk about and then we'll do a few demos. So I selected these two because they are not obviously related to a very popular Mozilla project. So I just wanted to show that the project doesn't have to touch Firefox or Firefox OS. So for example, we had a student doing great work on Thunderbird. He improved the interoperability between Gmail and Thunderbird. <coughs> I'm sure plenty of people are really happy that he did this work. Another example that happened last year is we had a student doing a prototype implementation for HTTP2 for the server implementation. That was the first working server implementation, which is great help to people trying to implement clients and discussing the specs. And now we are going to show three more visible projects for which we can do a, a demo. So uh, this was a project from, I think, either 2012 or 2013, uh, which was mostly done as Summer of Code and then picked up, polished up, and checked into the tree. This is the Mozilla networking dashboard. If you go to about colon networking in, in any copy of Firefox, uh, you will find this. Um, it shows you um, all of the open connections, the ports they're on, bits about the connection, what hosts they're to. Um, there's information about DNS requests. You can't quite see the whole UI there, but up in the top left-hand corner. Uh, and all sorts of things like that. You can get it to auto-refresh, uh, and you can see who your browser is talking to. Uh, another project did some very interesting uh, bits of um, coding from the Mozilla Developer Network, which is our site for helping people learn about web standards, uh, which everybody who writes HTML, CSS, and JS should use and tell all their friends about. Um, we built some what are called CSS generators, which are little kind of web page widgets that help you design the CSS visually for some particular effect that you want. So this, there's a new CSS property in CSS3 called border image, which takes an image uh, and splits it up. 
so that um, you can make a border out of it instead of having to do manual image slicing and having a top left corner, a middle, a top right corner, and so on. You can have one image and then use the CSS to make the splits. Right, so here we have all sorts of widgets and controls. You pick a, a sort of a border image style image, go up a bit on the left, uh, and then you fiddle with all of these. Uh, and as you fiddle, the, um, the sort of the appearance of the border changes until you've got the CSS right, um, and then you copy and paste the generated CSS from the box at the bottom, uh, and you're done. Uh, there's a similar one for border radius, where you can kind of drag until your box looks just like the top right and top left corners of a Samsung Galaxy S3. Uh, and then you'll be happy. Uh, and, um, you know, the Samsung Galaxy S3 is like the first smartphone ever designed by lawyers. If you look at it, you will notice that the top left and top right hand corners have a different border radius on the X and the Y, and they again have a different border radius to the bottom left and the bottom right corners. And this is because Apple has a patent on black rounded corner rectangles. <laughs> anyway, C CSS box shadow generator. Um, this, there's a box here, uh, and if you, uh, again, it's, it would help to be able to see the left part of the screen. You can add box shadows to it and sort of define how far out they are and what color they are and so on and so forth. Um, all with kind of beautiful color pickers and graphical drag and drop this and that. Um, and then copy and paste the CSS from the bottom. Anyway, the last one I want to show you on the next tab um, is um, probably the most visually impressive Summer of Code project that we've had thus far. Um, and this, uh, I think it's better to show. Um, so if you press the right button. It, yep, that one. And on the right one? Yep, press that. This is a great way of figuring out how web pages are made up and what problems they may have with your boxes and their stacking and that kind of thing. This is called Tilt. Um, and it's a 3D web page debugger. Um, e even in the 3D view, which uses OpenGL, you can still select nodes and do all the sort of standard DOM manipulations on them from the Firefox developer tools that you could when you were looking at the web page in 2D. Um, and so you can also see how the, the layout of the page changes. This is a Twitter timeline, which you can see has a reasonably clean and neat construction. If you do this on some old school HTML, it will look ugly. Um, Flat, you mean. Sorry? Flat. Flatter and ugly. Um, but uh, there you go. So um, one guy did this in eight weeks, which is pretty darn cool, to be honest. So this is all about what we have done in the past with Summer of Code. It's all nice and cool, but I think you're more interested in what we can do in the future. So we are now going to talk about participating in 2014. At this, part, uh, at this time, we are currently collecting project ideas. So we are collecting right now ideas for projects that have a mentor. So if you are considering applying, uh, as participating as a mentor, you can submit your ideas on this wiki page. <coughs> You don't have to copy the URL right now. We'll make sure it's easy to get it later. Don't worry. And you should try to find ideas that are well uh, sized for eight weeks of work from a student. And we can sometimes help you understand if it's long enough or, sh or too short or too long. And it can be for any Mozilla project. So it can be for Firefox, of course, Firefox OS, Firefox Android, but also for Thunderbird, for Instandard, for NSS, for Bugzilla, or any other Mozilla project you can think of. And last but not least, it really needs to have a mentor. Yeah, so every, every year, um, and th this is why we have, if you see a brainstorming page, and there's another official page with the ideas that we think are actually credible. The first year, we didn't have that separation, uh, and people put all sorts of, you know, I would like it if Firefox did this awesome thing on the list, but with no idea about how long it would take or who would mentor it or anything like that. And then students applied for those ideas, and we had to turn them down because we didn't have a mentor and it was a ridiculously inappropriate project. And that's really not fair on the students. Uh, that you know, you kind of suggest that this option might be available, but then it really isn't. And they put all the effort into writing an application, and yeah, so we don't do that anymore. Instead, we have the brainstorming page. And to get from the brainstorming page onto the main page, an idea has to be the right size, and it has to have someone who is willing to mentor it. So, if that's you, great. 
stick your idea down. Awesome. If, it's, if you're not able to mentor it, you probably need to find someone who is or who is willing to consider doing that before putting your idea on the page because otherwise it's really not fair on the students and we can't copy it onto the main page. Okay. And so this was the part for proposing projects. Now for applying as a student. So of course this is assuming Mozilla is selected again as a mentoring organization by Google because this selection doesn't happen yet for this year. The thing you need to do is really discuss the project idea with a mentor first before applying because it will help you ensure that you have a correct understanding of the project and it will really help you improve the quality of your application. And also keep in mind the date. So this year the program starts earlier than during the previous years and you need to apply between March 10th and March the 21st. And here is some more advice for students to increase your chances of being selected. So I would really encourage you to send more than one application because every year we have a situation where there's a popular project and we receive several great applications from excellent students and we won't select more than one student per mentor, usually. So we will have to turn down some great applications just because there are other great applications for this project. So you reduce the, the risk of being in this situation if you apply for more than one project. Yeah, Google but now has a limit of five. If you can write five good applications, that's good. But, you know, maybe three is the right number, maybe. Yeah, so you probably don't want to send more than three applications to the same organization. Yes. It would risk being seen as spammy, so try to focus on quality rather than quantity, but try sending more than one. And something I really like to suggest to students is apply for one of your own ideas. It's way more exciting as a student to work on something you thought of yourself, scratch your own itch, and also there's less competition. If it's your own idea, you will be the only one applying for it. So I'm assuming it's a great idea, it will significantly improve your chances. But keep in mind you need to have a mentor. And finding a mentor for your own idea may be a little bit diffi more difficult. Yeah, this is, this is where often self-proposed ideas fall down. Even if they're correctly sized and appropriate for a summer of code project, if, I mean, when we get ideas and we think they're good ideas, we will go and try and find a mentor for you. But we have a big pile of things and there's not much time. And if you propose it and say, and so-and-so has offered to mentor, that makes your application for your own project much more likely to succeed. Okay, we are now going to take questions. Ludo. So, uh, what shall I do if uh, I'm a student and uh, I don't get along with my mentor and everything gets screwed up because we have bad communication and it's not, it's not only my fault, it's also the mentor's fault, right? Okay, so what the question was, what do I do if I'm a student and I don't get on with my mentor? Uh, and the answer is, uh, you come and talk to us. Um, and we deal with each situation. Uh, on its merits, but it is extreme. I don't think I've ever had that happen, that students and mentors have completely fallen out uh, in a we can't work together kind of way. I mean, students sometimes just go off the radar and stop communicating, but that's, you know, um, and the mentor tries to encourage them, but they've, they've just kind of given up on the program. Um, but I, I've, I've not really had to kind of separate two warring, <laughs> two warring participants in the past, so it's quite rare. I have another question. Do we get recurring application from the same student uh, a year after year? Like the guy did something great the first year, mm. comes back. Does that help that he did something great the previous year when he reapplies? Um, do we give, the question is, do we give additional credit or kind of uh, look more closely at applications for people who've been before? And I think the answer is generally no. Each application is assessed on its merits for that year with the resources that we have and the other quality of the other applications and so on and so forth. I mean, if you've come and you've done stuff and then you disappeared for 10 months and didn't do a thing and then come back and go, I want to do another project, that might actually be, in a sense, a net negative because it's clear that you're not actually interested in being involved with Mozilla. You just want the money. Uh, on the other hand, if you've come and done it and you've carried on, then probably lots of people will know you and you'll be a known name. But it's the fact that you're a known name and you're a community member that gives you the boost, not necessarily the fact that you did Summer of Code the year before. Uh, other questions? Why do you say A grades is so slow? Cool. Why do you say uh, eight weeks is about three months on the GSOC website? Uh, the GSOC project, you said it takes eight weeks. 
Uh, the, the coding period, I believe, is eight weeks. But the, isn't that right? Or is it? It's 13 weeks. I think. 13 weeks, this, okay. Yeah, it, it got longer uh, last year, but even before that it was like 10 or 11 weeks. Okay. It's, it's, it, yeah. And I think it's now 13 it's, until it's as long as Google's, the, the coding period is as long as Google says it is, not as long as we say it is. Okay. Okay. We do not have an extra special short coding period for Mozilla. <laughs> Any more? What makes a good mentor and like, you know, what is a bad mentor? What is a good mentor? What's the difference? Florian? <laughs> so the advice I would give to mentors is first to get in touch with the student as soon as possible and try to get the student to be involved in the community. Try to not treat the student as if it was your employer, your contractor, but try just to introduce the student to everybody in the community, get the student to talk to everybody and get on track as soon as possible as if he was a regular contributor and not just someone paid to do some work and some stuff. So I've noticed during the year when I was a mentor that we get much better results if we get the student to submit small patches at the beginning of the coding period or even before in the community bond, uh, bonding period, because then they will already be used to submitting patches to how people work in this community, in this team. And something I would give as advice to mentors is, uh, that I especially like and when I've done it, is give the student a very small project for example, uh, something that you would do yourself in one weekend, but for the student it will be for two weeks, for example, and see how they work on this and help them fix their working habits. And if you can get them to con uh, contribute correctly in two weeks, something relatively small but that touches the same code area as they will be touching later, then they will have all the tools uh, to get started quickly when it's actually the coding period. I'd add something else as well, which is that for cultural reasons, some students particularly students from certain areas of the world, are reluctant to show other people code which does not work perfectly. And the tendency to not show code until the student believes it works perfectly is absolutely disastrous for a summer of code project. And therefore, you need to, by coaxing, cajoling, wheedling, um, promising, whatever you have to do to them, um, persuade them that they need to show you their code and that you can comment on it and improve it and help them move in the right direction, wherever your student is from. Um, because the whole big bang patch at the end with a week to go, hey, can you please review this now, I'm done, almost always ends in complete disaster. So a, a good mentor does not allow that. Ludo. I have one last question. I have one last question. And the last question is, um, what's the success uh, failure rate of past projects? Um, so say he had, oh, I missed thread. I didn't listen. Ah, crap. There. There you go. Thank you. So it's getting so it's getting better. Um, it, possibly. I it's you know it's because the numbers are so small. Variances are hard to say if they're statistically significant. I mean, eighty-five percent on average, and that's what Summer of Code has itself. Yeah. I mean, you know. You, it, it, no, there's not been a single year where every student has passed, although I think we nearly managed it last year. Um, yeah. Okay, well. Um, okay, one more question. Yeah. Yeah, shout it and I'll repeat it. Thank you. So if you're a woman, GNOME Outreach Program for Women, or the Outreach Program for Women run by GNOME, is a similar thing but with different criteria and different admission criteria and all that sort of thing. So you should look and see if you qualify for that um, as an option as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, those of you who stuck your hand up as students, we do hope that you will uh, consider applying. If you have any questions, you can catch either of us at FOSDEM uh, or send us email. Um, we would love to help you get involved. Thank you.
So, uh, a lot of people are coming for this talk, so uh, please go into the middle to let people find a place.